Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm happy to have a short conversation this time with Alice Hughes and Sam Gregson about recent developments, as always in the lab leak mythology. There is always a new paper that claims to suddenly change everything. There has been, you know, refutations that were not good refutations, and now there's a new bioweapon risk assessment being published. It comes out this Friday. The conversation is recorded now on Wednesday. So we are a bit early because Alice Hughes sounded the alarm more or less that this is not a very scientific paper. This is not a scientific approach. And so, of course, we want to give her the opportunity. I suppose to drag us back into the uh, the beautiful world that is yeah. uh, lablic science. To give her the opportunity to discuss this a little bit. Of course, we would try to give it a fair shake. I also looked a bit into it. Um, just as a general notice, I have to say that we often see, you know, statistical Bayesian uh, intelligence assessments, you know, super forecasters, uh, you know, poll questions, all these types of assessments of the lab leak versus the zoonotic hypothesis are kind of odd because they are not really following much scientific evidence. They are more like a layer on top of that. They're kind of meta analyses of whatever uh, parameters people choose to take. And, you know, this this often leads people astray. Let's put it like I've this. Got, I've got to kind of jump in on that because yeah. this – I'm seeing increasing numbers of these kind of Bayesian analyses that, that say, you know, this is definitely a lab leak or sometimes it's definitely not a lab leak, but usually that it's, it's definitely a lab leak inescapably. And as far as I can tell, you know, I'm not particularly qualified to talk in the biology, but I am – highly qualified to talk about the maths that I see coming out, right? And a lot of this stuff, as far as I can tell, is just the inherent biases of the person making the analysis being churned through a load of numbers that sound clever and sound Bayesian, quote unquote, to hide the fact that they're basically just putting their, their own biases on a page, right? And they'll do things like say, you know, we did a, a thousand runs of this model and we let the... the um, the individual numbers flow and all these kind of fa fancy things. But if those numbers are constrained to be within these ridiculous bounds that they've already decided, then the model can't explore the proper parameter space and you get these silly results. So as far as I can tell, these results don't really mean anything. They're just a person saying, my opinion and read of the evidence is this. And they usually come from non-experts in the field. So... I don't give them a great deal of weight, and I'm sure Alice will will comment on how much weight she gives them. But I just see them as kind of boring. If you've got the solid evidence that's going to move the needle, cool. I really want to see it. But and just see these these opinion pieces essentially kind of obscured by what seems to be a layer of math to try and make them sound sciency. I find them quite tedious, to be honest. And I think this, this was the perfect introduction happening. for today, right? Because the next assessment, it doesn't go deep into mass, but it still uses an established framework to risk assessment, but it uses it improperly. And it still is a way to kind of get personal opinions through a kind of layer of, you know, technical terms uh, to launder to launder it into a paper, which actually doesn't really mean much. Thank, thank you for dragging me back in to discuss it. That <laughs> sounds fantastic. I'll let Alice, Alice wanted to jump in there, I think. So. Yep. Um, so completely agree with everything that's been said. One of the issues with papers like these is they use what appears to the layperson to be a scientific method to prove something, but it's distorting that scientific method. So for one thing, this kind of analysis should be relying on a set of rigid, fair criteria that evaluate probabilities. Yeah. It does. If you're do poisoned up front, everything that flows down is, yeah. is constrained in some you know systematic way exactly because if you are framing a set of scores from the outset you are mm. going to get the outcome you are looking for and the paper we're talking about today they do just that every parameter is manipulated and misinterpreted in such a way that they are going to presuppose an outcome and even their scoring method does that mm. and so basically if you have a score that is more than half of the maximum score they say that that lends weight to the lab leak but the issue is that their zero score is for no data, not no chance. And that means that everything has a minimum score basically of one because you've 
got some form of data for everything. Right. This means that your minimum score is already going to be a third of the maximum value. And so if you only have a few things that are uncertain, you've already weighted it. So your outcome is going to be the higher probability. That of also being... seems weirdly, I don't know exactly the, the nature of this paper, that also seems weirdly unnormalized as in the fact of mm. if you throw more shit at the wall, even if it's not particularly good, then that just adding yeah. extra points on, right? Is that I yeah. don't I don't know yeah. exactly the the methodology, so I'm, I'm sure. So you're I will I will that. overlay in the video. I will overlay the metrics that we have. Okay. I will just um, give a bit of history. So because I was curious, uh, and this is the only preparation I did for this uh, conversation. I was curious where does this come from? So the new paper that will come out on Friday proposes basically an assessment of the naturalness or unnaturalness of the outbreak uh, that le led to the pandemic in Wuhan uh, and it's uh, referencing the Gunro Finke um, kind of you know framework so what is this original Gunro Finke framework so this was a procedure that uh, people developed in situations of high uncertainty war zones whatever if an outbreak happens you know was this a biological attack or not so you see already the framing is kind of from a from a biological weapon standpoint, where they come from. And they had assessed a couple of criteria that, you know, you, you can give scores, very basic scores from zero, one, two, or three. And then, you know, you basically sum up the criteria, the higher the score, the more likely it is that this was a bioweapon uh, uh, attack. So this was the, the original one. And then the paper we're talking about is kind of a modified version. So the, the author is um, an Australian, um, I think, epidemiologist, but also working in the in the biosecurity space, um, a bit of a controversial figure in herself. And, and she had already in 2019 adopted uh, the Gunro Finke calibration, basically looking at 10 different um, outbreaks and classifying them, you know, the original kind of thing he didn't predict it very well. And so what they did, she tuned the parameters to say that okay. now, because we have, you know, perfect knowledge that this was or this wasn't um, an unnatural outbreak, they did they, they tune basically the parameters a little bit and added some extra parameters to kind of get this granularity of saying, now we can classify these 10 past events uh somewhat more accurately I mean, it doesn't seem like a crazy thing to do it no just it's not like it's what, not crazy. whatever you put in yeah yeah okay so so this is the the outset and then of course you know uh, just to look at the parameters what they are assessing is basically first is is there an existence of a biological risk in the space of the outbreak is there an unusual kind of pathogen are there some peculiarities in the distribution of how the disease uh you know spreads or is moved um, is there a high concentration of the biological agent in the environment? Are there any peculiarities in the intensity or the, in the dynamics of the outbreak? Are there any peculiarities in the transmission mode of the agent? Are there any peculiarities uh, in the time of the pandemic? Is it, you know, an unusually rapid spread? Are there some uh, limitations to specific populations? You know, this makes all sense if you think about a ah, bioweapon, you know, Syria, whatever bioweapon attack on a religious minority or something like that, right? These factors play a role. In our case, you will see these actually don't really so, play So I was just going to say, for the jump in, I don't want to say too much, but the the nature of what you're saying, this seems to be, if, if you're worried that it's been a biological attack, you obviously, even if there's like a tiny possibility it was a biological attack, obviously the the risk of that is going to be extreme, right? So because the whatever agent has been used is designed mm. to kill as many people as quickly as possible. So even a tiny possibility of a biological attack means that you want to take that very, very seriously. Now, does that generalize properly to an actual, ordinary outbreak? To an outbreak. ordinary uncertainty where you're you're not as potentially concerned that it was a, a biological attack. I know some people are. Mm. Um, you know, on the more extreme fringes. Yeah. But does that generalize correctly? I don't know. I guess we'll see as you discuss it more. But yeah. this seems mm -hmm. 
may be a misapplication of a method. I don't know yet because I haven't heard what you've said. But So the, the last two points, just to finish this verse, are there any peculiarities in the clinical manifestation of, you know, what's going on? Was well, also makes a lot of sense in, bi in, in bioweapons, right? And the last one is something that Rainer added recently, which is kind of, are there any special insight that are suspicious, right? And this is, of course... There's no criteria. It's just like anything could be a special insight into the outbreak, right? And we will also later see they weigh this very strongly. So just if you say, you know, special insight, ooh, there was, you know, in, in the lab leak circus, there was, you know, uh, the diffuse proposal earlier or something, which we know doesn't say anything about the outbreak, but they can already, you know, shift it by like 10% of overall assessment. Right. So this is, this is why, you know, like Alice said, it seems a way to kind of get your opinion in. But good, these were the rough criteria and now we can discuss a, a bit more about it. But well, just uh, building yeah. on that before we jump in directly, the other issue is that for any of these, you would normally have a set of sub criteria that it does X, Y, and Z. There is no sub criteria. Yes. So within each of these, you just plug in your data and interpret it as you will. And with something like that, it is very vulnerable to subjective assessment. If it's like, yes. oh, well, there's this and there's this. And so we'll, we'll score it this way. There is no way of breaking it down into a higher level of granularity. And that yeah. means you can manipulate the scores because you can plug in basically anything. Exactly. And the accuracy of that data is not going to be assessed because it's a subjective assessment of anything under that, those overall umbrellas. So, so usually... Again, I'm trying to stick more to the the kind of methodology and the data because that's more what I'm what I'm kind of qualified to talk about. But usually, if you had that kind of subjectivity in the scoring, you'd have some sort of um, confrontational group that were going to sit down and hash that out and come to some sort of score with an uncertainty. Who does the scoring? For this is a very analysis? good question. So the authors uh, did the scoring. They said in the independently, you know, Who but this was. Sorry. Uh, okay. two of them but then they still had the discussion <laughs> after to narrow it down on one opinion so do you understand <laughs> so instead not, not of really, keeping but... the uncertainty of the assessment and reporting the uncertainty of how they differed in the different criteria Which normally it... you'd have like a proper right. song okay they might differ but surely there's a very... big old if they both agree that it's probably a lab leak there's a big old systematic in there yeah. never mind like oh well we had some spread around yeah, okay, but your thing's been shifted up yeah. by 50%. And also, there's no point because they changed after. So they, they, they said they scored independently, but then anywhere there were, where there was a discrepancy <laughs> between the scorers, they discussed about it to, to converge on one I value. I love your expression there, Sam. Yeah, I, this yeah is it sounds issue. terrible already, but okay, <laughs> fine. I mean, yeah. But I mean, this is why it needs discussing because a lot of people be like, oh, it's a published scientific paper. It must have some rigor and value and the reality is even before we get to the highly flawed science the scoring system does not make any statistical sense they are already presupposing outcomes which is not what science is meant to be doing i mean I, the science probably is going to be your domain alice mm -hmm. but it sounds um doesn't sound yeah. great from a mass perspective yeah. at the moment but so, okay we'll we'll, we'll... i i I, Experts, I will, I'm sure, will jump in on this. and We, we can sh jump in. So point is, you know, this is an assessment that is, you know, meant to be for biological weapon assessments. It has been modified by the author to say maybe we can use it to assess the likelihood of unnaturalness of outbreaks. And then, of course, it's just, you know, counting up the criteria based on subjective, you know, giving points. And then there's one more... Uh, so, so Philip, sorry, sorry, yeah. just to just to cut you off again. So, usually, wouldn't the way that you would do this would you would essentially train it, tra you know, tweak your variables, make sure they give the right output. That would be your kind of training set, and then you would apply it to some, you know, unnatural and natural outbreaks that we know yes. have perfect knowledge as a training set. Does it perform well on that training set? Is there information? So yes. So this is the what I mentioned earlier. There's a 2019 paper where they did that. Okay. Basically, they took the original gun roof thinking and then they calibrated it on ten out outbreaks where they know whether they were natural ten. or not. Okay. Ten. It's a, it's a small <laughs> number, but it's you know it's 
it's not that easy. We don't have that many unnatural sure, bioweapon sure. no, attacks or whatever. But but what I'm saying is, I'm, okay, so I'm sure they did the kind of best but, they but could, wait a but second. it's still so, going to be a lot of error there. So right? what happens is then when you get this, right, you get a score of like 60 points. And then it's basically like, you know, if you have the full 60 points, it's 100% that this was unnatural. If you have zero points, although you cannot really okay. get zero points, uh, you have 0% of a natural, right? And then, you know, the original Gunro Fink, he was actually saying, look, this is just, you know, a rough uh, estimate. And, you know, zero to 33% is basically means this was natural. And then when you have 33 to like 60%, you say it's most, it's uncertain, but it's most likely nothing. And then if you have over 63 okay. to like 90%, you say, okay, there is actually a, a, a reasonable expectation that this could have been an unnatural event. And then above that, it's kind so of. So 90% of the 60 points, is that what? you're saying so exactly yeah 66 percent okay. was like you know the in the original gun it was like 40 you, points or if, something. You, if you have over 40 points right. then you say okay. okay now now it's get this way right um so the, the the adaptation actually doesn't really do that anymore they say flat we take the percentage value so if you have 30 points out of 60 a that's point. a 50 percent odds that this was an unnatural outbreak so mm -hmm. so it kind of somewhat really makes and it no, worse there is not a basis for that before yeah. you ask if That's they just scales not like correctly calibrated though that doesn't no. <laughs> so so it, this it is like when well, this is like when someone in physics does their calculations in yeah. celsius instead of kelvin yeah. right you haven't set the zero correctly yet yeah. so so for me anyway. one, what, why i don't like this why i prefer the original gunbo thinky is because in the original gunbo thinky because you have these windows between this and this percentage you just say no likelihood, low likelihood, you know, uncertain, possible, and very possible, right? Then you have just, you know, it gives you the right granularity of these assessment types. When you now give, ah, this is a 42%, you know, uh, lab leak, or this is a 92% lab leak, you, you, you basically suggest that there is a depth of granularity to mm -hmm. the assessment behind it, when actually it is not. Yeah, because, and it's correctly calibrated to zero and yeah, 100. Yeah, because even not. if you just change one assessment by one point you don't get from 42 no, of to course 43 not. It's not, it's not you get suddenly yeah. to 56 yeah, or whatever okay. right? right yeah yeah. So, I, yeah and just if you were wondering their score is 41 so yeah just sneaking in there they, they, they tweaked it they tweaked it to just go a little bit over the 66 percent uh, that basically say this is highly likely that this was a lab leak so you can also see that they really tried right. to get to these points well, I don't know what they've done behind the scenes, but I'll yeah. just say I'm not surprised. No. Good. I, I don't know what they've done. I'm, I'm, let's assume I know, that they've I know, done I know it what they've done because I've yeah. read, the, I've had the misfortune Five. of reading the paper. All right, I'll leave it to you to yeah. say what they've done. Then. Okay, now just before we jump into the individual criteria and, and ask what, what why did they assess the way they did, if we even should go that deep, um, how did you hear about this, Alice? Because you, I guess a reporter reached out to you asking for your feedback. Is, is that what happened? So I'm part of the Science Media Center for the BBC, basically one of their advisory people. So when papers come out that we might be able to comment on, we will get sent either the paper or a press release to give comments on. Mm -hmm. And I will weigh in when I have things to weigh in on, but also countering misinformation. And the reality is that a lot of the lay public do not have the scientific literacy to understand things. So if it appears in a big flashy newspaper or something, they're going to believe it. They're going to believe that there's good science behind it. And so as a scientist who cares about accurate, accurate data and reality, I feel duty bound to actually make comments that say, hang on a minute, we need to be careful on this. And the the response was because they did relay my comments they're like they're gonna run it anyway um and their their exact words were uh basically because of scientific integrity this needs mm -hmm. to be run and i was like yeah no it it doesn't do that um and so it is we're not in a good situation when the, the narrative is becoming progressively distorted by bad actors and you can't do a paper like this really in entirely good faith. They presupposed an outcome. You can't do that in the sciences. You need to have fair and balanced assessment. And if you look at how any of this is done, 
the we've already talked about the fact that the scoring scheme is not unbiased. The way that they are coming towards, even after scoring it, the likelihood or unlikelihood is biased. And then when we look at the data, it's misinterpreted and cherry picked. And so you have all of these layers, which means that, as we said at the beginning, the outcomes are not meaningful. But the problem is that people who read them are not going to realize that. And all they are going to come out with is, oh, another paper supports that it comes from the lab. But this is exactly something that that Philip's really big on, right? Because all that people see is they can't necessarily weigh that the way yeah. that they should give to that paper. They just say, oh my God, another paper's come out that says it's probably a lovely. But what is the value? What is the weight of that relative to say the Warabi paper or whatever other paper you want to put in? It's very hard for non-experts to read that. But people will will pump these papers out into the news because it looks very exciting. Oh my God, this has been assessed by a, a bioweapons framework as likely, yeah. you know, some I mean, sort of bioweapons attack. Not only is it related to something um, sensationalistic, it's the most sens- sensationalistic ideas in the lab leak world that this was an intentional release of a bioweapon into Wuhan. It's It feels yeah, like exactly. it's something that will get a lot of clicks and play, even with the more extreme end of lab leak stuff, but doesn't necessarily illuminate things very much. And, and hence... Is it something that should be being covered? Now, I don't know. Um, both of you will know more about this than me, but it seems that when people put out articles on Lovely, they don't really do a lot of digging into the background work of a lot of the figures who did this paper. Do they have a good reputation in the space? Because, you know, we had the problem with the, the endonuclease paper where people just didn't check that these people are very extreme yeah. on this topic. Do we do the, do we have any idea about their previous work on on this, Alice? I think Philip had a look. I haven't looked into them. The paper the paper told me enough of what I needed to know. <laughs> okay. um, so yes, so uh, for average citizens, and this is what I used to say. Sometimes it's kind of good because you don't want to spend hours going through a paper to assess what is its merit. Sometimes Mm. it's just good to look at the people and see if they're behaving like scientists, talking about evidence, you know, have a track record in the field of expertise, or if they are more acting like activists, you know, pushing a certain, uh, you know, certain agenda, uh, interacting with activists online, whatever. In this case, what I have to say, this professor from from the um, University of Australia or one of of, uh, Australian University, she is credentialed. She has worked in the field. The field is kind of small, but she has also has a bit of a reputation as an outsider. But I think, you know, either way, I think we should give the paper, like Alice said, and the evidence a fair shake and not too much worry about, uh, you know, the person behind it. This is this is how I would approach. I was it. just interested, but of course we should, of course we should do that. And the reality is that even scientists are not necessarily going back to the paper; they are carrying the headlines at this point because there's so yeah. there is so much um, devotion to different narratives. And when I tell people that, yeah, I've worked on bats carrying similar viruses, the first question I always are, get asked is, "So tell me, did it come to the, from the lab?" And I'm like. No, there is no data that supports that. But the number of times, whether it's a layperson or a scientist, I've had that in multiple countries, shows how dominant that narrative Mm. is now and why we need to work to counteract it, especially when we need to maintain collaborative links between different countries rather than maintaining this highly politicized viewpoint that does not have a scientific backing. Good. I think this is a good start to now really break it down a bit more to the science. So um, so this paper, you know, there's subjective scoring involved. We're not going to go too deep about it anymore. But in general, I think it's not, it's not, you know, we should not be close to the idea that there are different ways to look at the problem and come to a conclusion. And I think in general, when you say you're working in a really highly uncertain environment, which I think is not the case anymore in the in 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 this origin discussion. But if you're really talking about you know clandestine operations, bioweapon, political uncertainty, regions with bad surveillance, authoritarian regimes, and some of that is still true for China, it's not completely uh, you know unreasonable to just look at a different framework for how to assess these things. And so I think the first point we should look at is you know. Uh, 
ourselves maybe we should just use the criteria and have a have a quick discussion so what is and i will just quickly read if that's okay and then we just talk about it sure. so one of the first criteria is you know is there the existence of a biological risk right so this would be the presence of a political or terrorist environment where such an attack could originate and um you know this could be if people have access to biological warfare agents and you know are they willing to use them so this is kind of the the idea behind this point and in addition a certain biological risk is also assumed if you know biological weapons are being developed in the place of the outbreak or nearby right and this is basically uh you know how they how they assessed ah we think there's a there's a chance because there was a coronavirus lab there's no evidence that this lab ever worked on biological weapon there's no evidence that they ever had a virus similar to this there's also no evidence that it leaked from that lab but clearly they say it's possible that they manufacture in using this framework it's possible that uh you know a biological warfare agent could have been there just based that the lab is in in there so what would you score ellis sam between zero and 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 three probably zero. best to let alice like um <laughs> so do the would scores. you say this is a, a you know is this a reasonable criterion i i guess it is and then what I would mean, you score it is a reasonable criteria but then if we're thinking about the ability to develop these things what countries wouldn't satisfy the ability that, that was that was my thoughts degree? about that in a connected world like yeah. how can you not get something yeah. to somewhere that they, they're all whinging about um you know, I don't want to dump on any countries, but they're all doing lab leak fantasies about Ebola in in various Sierra Leone and Sierra mm. Sierra Liberia, Leone, a well known yeah. like bioweapons hotspot. I I don't know. To to a lot of people, I assume it it might be. Yeah. Um. So, what country or what place on the world can't you get biological weapons agents to or? look yeah. at any any nowadays. big city will have a lab that has some kind and of the thing. university and, and, yeah yeah and so in any type of city you would have an outbreak this would kind of score somehow right yeah if if and we really say, say it's near the local cdc but yeah. often cdcs are mainly offices um and most big cities in china are going to have local branches yeah. of the cdc we had a yunnan cdc if you choose criteria that almost anywhere will satisfy, you're going yeah. to get a high score. The other issue is that they, of course, cited the diffuse proposal saying, oh, mm -hmm. but they, they mentioned these things. But there's no actual demonstrated proof that any of that yeah. work was done. Yeah. Um, but even that, I mean, diffuse had nothing to do with bioweapons. And, you know, no, another point for the didn't... criteria is like, are there people, you know, political or terrorist environment that would, you know, uh, conduct such biological attack right so this is also you know even if you say okay any lab you give it give it a point would you give it three points or would you only give it three points if you think ah actually there is motivated actors that could release such but a thing you're right? going to you're going to these most extreme ideas of lovely right not that it was yeah. you know some unintentional release that happened and you yeah. know somebody wanted no, no but this is this is for me like you can you only get to score zero to one and for me it's like okay a lab being there i would give maybe a one or or something and if there's some motivations or if we know that the lab was conducting you know uh bioweapon research i would maybe give a two and then if i know you know the political environment would also kind of be conductive for you know either for leaking such a thing and or having terrorists or political forces driving such an outbreak yeah, you would be, and this is then, why then i would give three criteria right? yeah and we don't have sub criteria we just yeah. have well there are all of these things in the background and so they gave it three points of yeah. it being very likely that it was modified and so first yeah. criteria they're doing that when it's, it's very lumpy isn't it it's yeah. not like like yeah. i think this is what you're getting at with sub criteria it's it's just oh they could have done it doesn't matter underneath that they said we didn't do it there's no evidence that they did it and yeah. and even if they'd have done yeah. it it wouldn't have created what we think it would mm. it's just well they could have done it one yeah. uh okay it's very lumpy there's no real granularity yeah. in there but, uh, but the issue here is that they they still opt for like maximum likelihood in this case yeah. so that, I mean, that's what I'm saying you're yeah. you're jumping like hugely across the scale like yeah. every time you because even if you acknowledge let's say that the lab is being there and they could have leaked from a lab is that necessarily a three 
or is it maybe more likely a one or a two, right? Because this makes a, a huge difference in the end assessment. That's what already, I'm saying. That because this is way all of the difference. Yeah. yeah. And again, this is somewhere where you have some speculation. You don't have any data, and yet yeah. they've gone yeah. for the highest score. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And you've also got the issue here. It seems like of the, the sort of cart before the horse idea with the with these labs, right? These labs are there because these viruses are a problem in that country, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, yeah. you could say, you know, Wuhan's a little bit more suspicious. The outbreak is in Wuhan, but they're there for a reason. They're not just there because ooh, yeah. bio weapons. Wuhan is the eighth biggest city in China. Out of yeah, the ten biggest cities reason. in China's eight have coronavirus labs that are doing very similar work because. After SARS, it was a big thing. And Hong Kong is the same story. Hong Kong has a bunch of coronavirus labs. You know, not yeah, surprisingly. they've done some of the lead work. I mean, yeah. yeah, SARS was a thing here. They kind of need more work to stop more epidemics. Exactly. So, so, so it seems like they're saying because a lab is there, ooh, big possibility that, you know. Yeah, uh, that, because the coronavirus lab is in the city, we yeah. give it three points. And I feel like this has been jumping through hoops to get to this assessment right but it feels like again this is a, this is a thing where if you're you know a military person who's looking at something and very quickly needs to assess do i need to take the harshest measures because this could have been an anthrax attack or something then yeah. you you do shove up to the like the highest possible level because you're like i need to be as certain as possible here because this could be the deadliest agent released on purpose to kill as many people as possible you need to go to the highest you know, yeah, yeah. level of but level again, of, you uh, need the sub criteria to say, okay, does it meet X, Y, and Z yeah. within this? Mm -hmm. And that is what should be controlling whether you yeah. give it one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. Not well, there's a couple of things that maybe could be potentially suspicious. Let's give it the full. Well, but that's what I'm saying. In, in a quick response, yeah. you know, military, I could see yeah. someone going, "Just give me, is it is it possible? Could this be an app? Could this be have been that's a response? Bang, 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 bang. Like, that's a we response. Need to actually, implement now not a not scientific paper. Now we're trying to yeah. work it out calmly, and and we have yeah. infinite time yeah. essentially to look at. Well, not infinite time because you know we want to take because action. time is infinite. Well, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, that as well, no, but because we want to re we want to react to these things. But essentially, relative to oh god, there's an anthrax attack. We have infinite time to work this out properly, and it mm -hmm. still seems like you're using a methodology that immediately jumps to the worst case scenario as far as i can you know yeah exactly i mean the, the thing and i can show you i mean it's super simple right it's just a spreadsheet and you type in nine numbers right you can do that in in a minute right and Imagine and and probably, probably for this type of assessment you know either critically it's good but then you know writing a paper deliver it about and yeah, exactly. then you know having a lot of time to motivate reason yourself into a conclusion seems not the most in fair. a rapid response scenario it seems like the correct thing to have something that yeah. you can you know, Mr. Yeah. Pre Mr. President, yeah. you know, we assess, you know, there's at least a 10 percent chance that this could have happened. Right. Take the most radical yeah. steps, make sure it wasn't a problem and, and then we'll deal with it. And if we overreacted, fine, at least a load of people aren't dead. But mm. it seems misapplied in this, uh, you know, in a more yeah. calm um, scenario. Good. The next yeah. one flows exactly into this. The next one is called unusual strain. So, you know, strain usually for bacteria, viruses, whatever. Lineage. Is this where the creationism starts to yeah, come? Yeah, so th this is like, is it in any way, you know, an atypical, rare, antiquated, newly emerging, lots of mutation, genetically engineered or edited? You know, is it something that is kind of aren't, weird aren't looking? Are all right? novel outbreaks novel? By sort yeah, of I mean, emerging viruses usually are Funny weird. Thing. So the thing um, is, so if you have an emergent virus, you know, from a new they disease, they will always look like this, right? Yeah. So you would, so this is kind of, your, but it doesn't mean that they were bioweapons, nor does it mean that, you know, we cannot tell often if something has been genetically engineered or not, right? Yeah. Anyway, it, and it so, so this, this is, is FCS and CCG, CCG, I assume, right? This is yeah, the same pure and Nick, Nick and Wade rubbish, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, ignoring the fact that we have putative furin cleavage sites in wild mm. viruses that are closely related, yeah. including one, bats that we caught, yeah. ignoring the fact that it's in influenza viruses and we've got the potential for recombination. Um, like it's but not again, but again, Alice, you're giving a proper probability distribution here of how likely these things are to happen, whereas yeah. this is yes or no. Tell me now. Tell me now. Yeah. Whereas. There's yeah. there's a big probability distribution where you can say, okay, this is actually very likely to happen in a virus. It's it's down here at 0 0.1, like likelihood that it's engineered. And they're going, tell me now, tell me now, is mm -hmm. it above zero? Okay, it's one. Yeah. Chuck it in. 
So also maximum points, hard to see, right? Obviously. Okay. Round up, good. Yep. All right. <laughs> and assuming that we have perfect data, assuming the fact that we haven't found identical ones in nature means that they're not there, rather than that we yeah. have so massive creation, data creation. gaps with no sampling. Yeah. Um we we don't have perfect knowledge. Uh, we know that there's going to be a whole lot more out there if we can get samples from different regions or more bats. We've only sampled the tip of the iceberg, and yet we still do have support for it being a zoonotic virus. So this is this was engineered until you can prove to me that it wasn't, which yeah, makes unless we no find sense. the exact same virus in it's, wildlife, then. which is textbook creationism. Okay. Yeah. Fine. There was a there was a big there was a big um thread this week by um is it Mark Johnson? Is it the solid evidence chap? You'll know his name, uh Billet. The guy who goes under the the um the tag solid evidence, is it on uh on Twitter? Uh, Mark, yeah. Is it Mark I Johnson? Mark, I think so, yeah. He did um a big long thread about the the likelihood of furing cleavage sites developing, and he's does a lot of work obviously in these um Cryptic lineages. These, these cryptic lineages that have been, you know, kind of evolving in 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 um, patients with persistent samples. infections and yeah. wastewater samples and stuff. And he was just talking about some of the um, solid evidence where for um, the likelihood of development of these furin cleavage sites and how easy it is for happen and how much evidence we have of, like Alice was talking about, these putative or or very very close to these furin cleavage sites in these viruses. So there's a probability distribution that it's very likely that they could jump across to create yeah. these things that's the numbers that you should be talking about when you shove into a proper probability analysis not okay could it happen okay that just round it all up to what yeah it's not a proper proper probability analysis it's just it, it's no. again it's again a framework that's been used to say does it look a bit dodgy yeah. take the worst case scenario you know set up the perimeter get all the hazmat guys yeah. in sort it out because that's so the, this is basically is anything weird then you know you can rank it right and yeah. and you know emergent viruses they, they have some weird elements otherwise you know uh, yeah. they would have jumped over earlier right so it's like yeah well not not the, really well applied in the case of emergent disease let's put it like this the other thing is it assumes that the first detected um virus was what it was like when it first spilled into humans and the reality is that the initial forms may have been very bad at moving human to human yeah. because that's what happens. But they won't have been detected, especially during flu season. And so those less well adapted versions may have been under the radar because why would you look when you've got respiratory yeah. diseases around anyway? And only when it becomes better at spreading are you actually likely mm. to detect it. And so by the time we start noticing these things, yeah, it's had time to be better at spreading. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not going to notice it. And it is spreading in mammals. It seems like it went by the animals and not via some silent spread in, in humans, right? You'll, be, you'll, yeah. get, you'll get certain people excited with these uh, early spread <laughs> ideas. Yeah. <You know? laughs> um good and, and sorry uh, i didn't want to yeah disrupt. but at the same time there's just there's too much assumption of perfect detection um yeah and yeah. we we have to assume that you're not you're not going to see the first cases because it's likely yeah. I mean, to be do you ever see the first cases no, in any outbreak no right? well, like... only if it's very very deadly like i don't yeah. know what mers looked like early on but it had a much higher fatality rate mm. so who knows? But actually, they probably died in a desert somewhere. If you got one a virus like this, where a lot of it is asymptomatic and exactly, then you're not going to see you it. Never. Yeah. It's very, very unlikely. Yeah. That I mean, the first genome we have is most likely not the first one was yeah. from the first infected patient, and we have some converging models now. Just recently, uh, we have seen another one that also brings the, the the spillover before the first case, like two weeks or so on average before the first case. Right. So yeah. I think, you know, it's pretty clear that end of November, uh, you know, the first spillover event happens or the first cases in, in, in yeah. around the Huanan market happened. And the, the first people that we really know about are only like in December 10, right? So, so yeah. we might want to, wasn't there, Philip, this week, you want to flag that up. The, so the the analysis from Picard et al. is that the, the spillover was probably mid-November, is it? Mid to yeah. late November yeah. um, at the market. That's the sort of date that they got, I think, from 
early November to like mid December or something. I can't remember the uncertainty, yeah. Yeah. but then there was a new paper or is it a new preprint this week from no, it's a new paper, a uh, new paper from the bar. And mm -hmm. was it Michael as well? I don't know if it was Michael as well. Uh, no, it was the bar and, and, and some, some other people involved, the German French guy and uh, some other French and, and German scientists. We can put that down in the, in yeah. the, um, in the description and get the, get the, the names. The, correct. The, basically a complimentary method looking yeah. at branching and also found all the timing actually, uh, matches with two other methods that mm. calculated it so, so we've got these you know, independent ideas coming yeah. to when the spillover probably occurred. okay we got, we got a bit sidetracked here i oh, know so just I'm to flag to that keep us on point yeah. to get this no, done, no, fine but... yeah you you're you're leading so you you go um but yeah so okay i'm, so I'm have... too used to being like in the driving seat of this yeah. right i'm like i gotta move it on right we have two maximum scores already so the next one is like you know are there any peculiarities of the geographic distribution uh of this uh disease right uh like the epidemiology a little bit right and and you know what is unusual and then of course we know what is unusual is that they all are around this wildlife market right and whatever um, so sometimes. you would assume at least that that feels like down down that, that should kind of weigh against, you know, a biological attack. In this case, of course, it didn't weigh against. They still gave it a point, but they didn't give it maximum points. I okay. think she, she gave it also, two points. Also, the writing here is crazy. They're like, yeah, well, they found it in sewerage in Italy and stuff. And I think a lot of that data is now had not yeah, as this is, this support is nonsense. when they look back at it. Yeah. yeah. And yet they still gave it two points, despite the fact that their argument is um, meaningless. Exactly. Like there is not a good rationale here. Yeah. Do they get Antarctic samples into it, or is that not? That <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. No. No, but, just Italy, yeah. France, US, and Norway. Mm. I... But it gets worse. Then don't worry. It gets worse with the sourcing. Some point the reference, you know, Sherry Markison's book and anonymous sources, and then you know really that they are fishing in deep, deep, deep <laughs> conspiracy waters for their assessments. Good. Anyway. It's still, you know, they still give points, so it's still going to get more likely. So you just think, although we have evidence to the opposite, it's still going to get more likely. Next thing yeah. is... Yeah, they still... But this is the big problem from the mass, right? And they're <laughs> saying it's not more likely, but it's still moving up the the scale, right? It's not pushing back against that. Yeah. If you do a proper probability assessment, yeah. if there's evidence that points against it, that pushes yeah. the probability down. It doesn't just stay there. Yeah waiting for more shit to be thrown at the well, wall they didn't but... even score it a one they scored it a two which means that it's more likely as well and you're mm. like hang on a minute like mm. if you score everything that you're going to come out with it automatically being more likely because of your poor scoring <laughs> so so you can never push back you can only push forward right <laughs> yeah, exactly. this doesn't make sense that's not a probability assessment like, <laughs> not... you know just just simple analogy for people if i'm measuring the length of this pencil right? I should be able to measure, I don't know, 12 centimeters. I should be able to measure 11 and I should be able to measure 13 and 14 and nine and then take a mean and get, you know, in the middle here. If I come along and I say, I measured it to be 10, they go, no, go back. That doesn't count. Oh, now I've measured it to be 11. Okay. We'll, we'll count that. We'll count yeah. That. And when you count, count 14, you count. That, that's allowed as well. We'll, have, we'll have that as well. We'll have that as well. But anything that measured down here, I yeah. can't have. So my mean is always. <laughs> exactly. That's not a probability assessment. And That's do you a... remember when I said they updated the original Gunrufinki assessment to include more criteria? Did yeah, you... but that's just more. Can I throw more <laughs> shit at the wall to keep it moving up? Exactly. Like, that's not. Mm. That's exactly if, if you're the point. explaining it to me correctly, which, you know, I assume that you are. <laughs> it sounds. Again, it sounds like something can. Can we throw enough stuff to be worried yeah. that this was yeah. a biological attack? Mm -hmm. Fine. In that yeah. scenario, I understand it. Yeah. But when you're doing a calm probability assessment, you need to have stuff that can weigh the other way as well. Exactly. Not... Anyway. But you but also need to have good point. data and clear interpretation, which well, they also yeah. don't do. That as well. But also but says, yeah, they also yeah. say the fact that MERS has a narrow distribution and SARS-2 uh, is, is global also means it's more likely to be unusual, despite the fact that they're different and have different etymologies different vectors yeah. etc like mers the reservoir host is camels camels don't generally tramp across the english countryside etc <laughs> like not yet wait for climate change <laughs> thanks Sorry. um but yeah again it's just like hang on a minute that that that's not a criteria so it is yeah 
And like I said, it's 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 been unfortunately not super scientific, but we we will do a summary in the end. I just want to get through and and then move but on. Gary, just, if you have more stuff, you have more chances to move up, but you don't have any chances to move down. It just yeah. makes no anyway. I've I've made belabored that point so let's move yeah. on so next one is high concentration of the biological agent in the environment so if the R agent is released artificially as an aerosol you would expect it in unusual high concentrations in the air in the soil drinking water whatever right so did they give a point here here they were they like you know a, they give a point which is the minimum they can give but again yeah. it was based on they give a point but you know what why they gave the point because there's a high contamination at the Huanan market. So, you know, maybe it was released there. <laughs> That's yeah. why I gave it a point. So you, again, again, you can't have says, anything that pushes back the other way, even no, though this is obviously no, something that pushes you can't, back the other way. Because zero is only no data. And yeah, yeah. there is always data, so there will always be points. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> Just they also make say, prizes. <laughs> They also say that no animal samples from the market tested positive, ignoring the fact that no animals it's were right tested there, so. from the market except like months after the outbreak. And so literally absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. There were none tested. How are they meant to be carrying it? This feels like a lot of just lab leak, like generic lab leak talking points, which have been long debunked. This idea that so and so thousand animals were tested well if you don't test the animals that were in the stalls that were there as they know they didn't because they were all cleared yes. out we don't know if those tests were done what's the that, relevance of going around testing a lot of cats then, then in the local the environment say. like it just doesn't mean anything yeah and again they 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 quietly ignore those realities but to somebody reading that they go wow they tested a hundred thousand animals and they didn't find you know or whatever the number yeah, is they exactly. didn't find anything Wow, that's crazy. The fact the that they literally state does not support a zoonotic spillover event in the market. And it's like, but you didn't test that. Like, mm -hmm. you can't, you literally can't get that data in that case. Uh, it's absolutely insane. Good. Um, I'm going to speed up the next uh, four criteria because they are not ranked super highly anyways, and they're still going to give right. points for them, but they they don't factor into the l l l large metric, let's put it like this, which is basically the the intensity and the dynamics of, of the epidemic, which they give two points uh, because, oh, this, you know, seems such a very strong uh, virus, right? Um, the transmission mode, oh, it spreads human to human, so, you know, also gets a point, of course. But this um, is this is... Right, to just just very quickly. Yeah. Surely this is like what, what do they call it? Texas sharpshooter or whatever, or survivorship yeah. bias. If you're not going to look at it if it doesn't spread, yeah. so, you know nobody cares. It's not yeah. a pandemic virus if it doesn't spread, so you're never going to look at it. So of course, when exactly. you get into a situation where you care to look at it, yeah. you you've already decided that it's spreading because you you're bothered about looking at it. So of, of course, it's going to fulfill that. Yeah. Like, uh, then the, the the other one is the, the the time of the outbreak is that unusual? Well, there was the, I think they did the military games there. What did they say? I'm two, not sure. Two, two thirty four. Yeah, PM. yeah. I had the fun <laughs> of listening to all of those conspiracies from the outset of well, maybe the Americans brought over them in their shoes or whatever. Like, I mean, events yeah. were happening in a massive city. Yeah, oh, okay. but Amer events tied to America. Yeah. Um, that was okay. that Chinese perspective. Uh, uh, like as I've said in previous recordings, every time they wanted there to be a, the West was saying, "Look at WIV." Within China, we would have petitions saying, "Oh, you need to look at the US. You need to look at Fort Detrick." Um, yeah. and they were tying that. But you military. see, again, can't you play that? You can play these back the other way, can't you? Because isn't yeah. uh, listen? I'm no China expert, Alice. You're far more of a China expert than me. But wasn't there like? one of the meetings of the CCP going on in Wuhan around this time or something. So maybe they wanted to cover up their incompetence at the market. So you can play all of these silly games oh, yeah. either way, right? And come yes. out with whatever score you like. And, and you can yep. justify it after the fact by saying, you know, oh, well, you know, they wouldn't want to show the same incompetence that they showed in, you know, in the early 2000s. Well, G is hanging around in town. That would be rule. And I can say, so oh, it's definitely going to be the market. And then somebody else can come along and go, oh, you know, but Wuhan military games and, yeah. you know, oh, a lab there. Oh, and then they can say it's completely the other way. How do yeah. you determine those probabilities in there? 
Like, you can't when you don't have a an actual objective scoring system. You just plug in whatever you yeah. want to so get it out. It just seems like if you can find something that justifies it, you just go yeah. points, 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 points. Exactly. So the, the, the point is basically you have 11 different categories for suspicion, which makes sense in a uncertainty biological weapon setup. It's like anything that is suspicious could potentially course, be you know, an indication. But you but could it, still break them down in a way that's more objective. Yes, yes, and the absolutely, science absolutely. within this is misinterpreted. Yeah. So a criteria six where they're like, oh, but there aren't rhinolophids near Wuhan. It can't have it can't have spilled over. Well, there are. They are across almost the whole of China, even if the diversity is lower. Yeah. Um so they are there. They also cite the less than accurate papers from certain groups that misanalyze their data uh, to say what animals were in the market and clearly misassigned things or contaminated their samples. Again, it comes down to misinterpreting data, cherry picking data, and actually not having a clue about what they're talking about. I mean, especially when it comes to things like the rhinolophid no. bats. Yeah, they're probably roosting in the forests around the city. Um, this is why we need real science going into these things rather than just dangerous rumor mongering. I feel like this is just a call for please do all of this science properly rather than, you know, running these silly games. Like, what are the questions we want to ask? You know, are there more of these viruses, particularly around the area? Do a lot more sampling, please, like the work you do, Alice. These are questions that actually need to be answered properly rather than just having people go, I'm going to give that that score because that's what I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is that even within these, when we analyze them properly, they're not static over time either. Yeah. Like looking at the bat distributions, those will shift, but also their probability of spilling over anything is going to shift depending on their stress. Doing an assessment like this tells us literally nothing. But if we use proper science, we can apply better criteria in a better way and get useful answers. Yeah. But you can miss use any tool you can use a spanner as a hammer if you want to but that doesn't mean you should <laughs> it, it, this this feels i to think me this, like, this yeah. comes already to the conclusion i just want to finish the last two points quickly and then we, sure. we do this because i think this is exactly what we want to talk sure. about now for finishing up um so the one thing where he actually gave zero points which i'm kind of thankful for after them giving points everywhere which is you know is the spread limited to some certain specific population meaning like is it like a, a bioweapon against specific people is it and one of these said, we have no data for that yeah, yeah this is like you know was Race it targeted? specific bioweapon exactly is, exactly right. okay. and at least there they gave zero because okay, they have right. no evidence for it either way so let's right. let's take it as is i mean the fact that's, that's not that's zero that's criteria like, mm. like how is that a criteria anyway we don't have a mechanism for doing that yeah i know i know i, I assume know. that means like you know is it aimed at a particular country that no, no, it it would make sense in a civil war enemy. context where yeah. you have, you know, okay. the, you know, like the, did this the happen in the against... US during the Cold War, for example? No, nah, or Sunni against Shia. You know, there's a Sunni yeah. the Shia yeah, okay. village, and the one gets attacked. You know, then you have the political aspect. You have the the population, you know, stratification based on uh, this is majority Sunni or whatever. Then in this context, it makes more sense. You it can, can be informative understand. to a certain extent, or at least raise suspicion, right? If you have, you know, I don't know, 10 villages, six Shia, five Sunni, and all this, uh, the, the, the Shia ones get attacked and not the Sunni ones, you have a certain informative value there when it comes to bioweapons. But for normal emergent diseases, this is, of course, misapplied. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing, and this is my biggest pet peeve of the whole thing that is absurd in its first place, which is the special insights. So... We said, you know, whatever you do, you just give it more points, right? And the special insights is one of the criteria that is the But this is what I said. This feels like, I, I don't know, I'm going to let you go off, but I'm going to let you finish. But the, this feels like what's going to come is we need to throw some more shit at the wall and keep it moving yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But from what I've heard so far... I mean, if you're anthrax add extra becomes things on. very relevant here. We have to talk about anthrax and the fact that something that happened in... 1979 is still relevant now about mm. making data not visible. Yeah. Um, again, like yeah. you, 
I would say you couldn't make this stuff up, but my point on that is it's proven by the existence of <laughs> now, 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 Philip, if you're going to add extra criteria onto something that has a fixed scale at 60, the normalization needs to move out. So if you're going to add, you know, 20% extra, hmm. the, the top bound needs to move out 20% so that the thing is still correctly normalized, right? Yeah, so they, they, especially... Do they do that? Yeah. Yeah, so right, they, they okay. added the special insights first and then recalibrated the whole thing. All right, right? okay. But well, at special... least they do that. I was well, I was worried that it might just yeah. be like, this stays mm. here, but we yeah. keep moving towards it. But, okay, but, but out of 60 points, the special insights gives nine points, which right. is like, you know, what, okay. over 15%? Something so, it's like very, so it's very important for that. It's very score. important right. for the overall assessment. And the criteria used here don't make sense. Like the fact that there was a blackout during October, November time. Mm -hmm. which just can, so I, can I just read, Alice, before you go, what yeah. they list as, as evidence? We're going to let you go off. Don't worry. Yeah. We, so any suspicious circumstances identified prior to the outbreak or during the period of the outbreak or after the outbreak did, did, did you get me any suspicious <laughs> circumstances identified at any point, prior to the yes. outbreak during the period of the after the outbreak in china as <laughs> uh, as <laughs> as viewed by western yeah. people it could I mean, be suspicions raised by someone anyone or an anonymous message or email it could be intelligence <laughs> not included in the criteria above so but this is just totally unnormalized, right? Because you can go to any place where anything happens and then just you will always look at people's find, emails yeah. and find something. You know, it's just you will like, find yeah, like, like the whatever. stone keeps tigers away. Yes. Yeah. And and as evidence, and now we come to, you know, anonymous sources. We come to Sherry Markinson's books where they said, oh, yeah, they bought a PCR machine, like any molecular biology lab. This is suspicious because before the pandemic went out, why would they need to have a PCR machine? It's like... You know, if this features into something like this, then I don't know what to say anymore. Um, and also like, oh, well, the, the there were people who didn't go to the office. There was a lab mm -hmm. shutdown in October to November. And it's like, yeah, that's national holiday. People go home. It's literally the only time of year that people can go home. They're not going to be in the office then. It feels like there's uh, a lot of a lack of local knowledge and like customs and behavior, which you would expect if from people who are outside of that area not necessarily talking to or not necessarily talking to people who are on the ground or not talking to them specifically because they already think that they're guilty so yeah i mean so yeah I, I i feel like this is just you know you will never have any you know this will always be full points obviously and this will always be you know at least 15 percent. so you can this never is why have... so much of lab leak discourse is like trawling through people's emails and tea leaf reading into yeah. what they meant rather than what they write in papers you know because you can spin it into whatever nefarious thing you want if you know if, i wouldn't want people you know no i'm sure none of us would want motivated horrible people reading through our emails to try and tea leaf read what we actually mean about things <laughs> yeah. you know it, and if you don't cherry pick those messages you find that it's actually much shorter sure. than that sure. unsurprisingly and also that scientists have a sense of humor amazingly no. enough we don't yeah, just spend the entire that doesn't day fly well with conspiracy. in the dark no you're well, not allowed to make I jokes mean, that doesn't while you're well. getting attacked and abused every single day you just have to sit there and take it because if you react in any way you're being you're being uncivil so you know that's Good. Never, so those, now those we put a hat on this assessment and, um, and maybe we, we have some summary thoughts. I first want to give a bit of a strong case, uh, what I think. So I think in general, it's not bad to have alternative methods trying to assess something. You giving a strong, but, strong case. For, strong wow. case for why really? I think it's not completely useless to do these exercises. Okay. Good. Um, so, and done well. Caveat. When done, but yes. When done. So this is the first thing. I think it's good to have complementary approaches, even sure. from outside of, you know, strict epidemiology, virology, uh, you know, outside of these fields, complementary approaches can and have helped science to get a more complete picture of circumstances. So absolutely on board with that. Second, I think we have to do your careful. papers is the mess. Like, definitely yes. do papers. Yeah. Put them but, out for peer review. Yeah. But what this I is find the way to do it rather than Twitter. And what I think disappoints me most is not the fact that it's being covered in the media as I know that it will be. It's the fact that this went through peer review. Yeah. Here, 
we know that the scoring is flawed from a scientific perspective and a mathematical perspective. And so surely any reviewer should have pulled up the fact that this framework does not do what it is meant to do. How has it got through peer review unless some, like unless you've got people who are just not doing their job at reviewing the paper? Because the whole point of peer review and the fact that we realized during the pandemic that actually giving a lot of uh, media to preprints is not necessarily wise is peer review is meant to check the rigor of the scientific methods and as we've highlighted here this does not meet that on any grounds yes and this is my next uh, point which is like it seems that this uh, gunro finky assessment while it might have a use for certain specific applications it does not seem to be an adequate tool to assess emergent outbreaks because by these criteria, any emergent outbreak would most likely look suspicious uh, just based on how the criteria are set up and based on this methodology. This does not mean that in a bioweapon specific context, this is not useful because then when it's about quick assessment, anything that could be suspicious, you know, these are social, political, other factors involved, of course, then you should consider this as a policy maker, as a decision maker. This makes a lot of sense, but does it really make sense retrospectively applying think, it to an emerging? Well, the big problem is that in on, a Alex, different you way, then yeah, it might actually be useful. Yeah. The fact is that the modifications have actually increased all of the biases. And so you might be able to use it with very careful application of criteria. Mm -hmm. But they've done the opposite to that, and they've removed any ability to independently and in a standardized way make these kinds of assessments. Even their, okay, we'll have two people scoring it, falls apart when they're like, and then we'll compare notes, and we won't have any uncertainty. And actually, we both thought the same thing to begin with, which is why we were writing this paper. It seems like they've gone from, you know, if they've shown that this works, quote unquote, even for a small sample, they've gone from perfect knowledge of past outbreaks to now okay that means we can throw in a load of subjective ideas that we've come up with and and yeah. that model will still hold perfectly mm. because <laughs> yeah and <laughs> and just let me let me give an, another historical thing so when we look at the recalibration of known and unknown uh, net unnatural outbreaks right their scoring method wasn't very precise either because even for proven natural ones they would be in the 40% range sometimes, right. right? Or 29% range. And even for proven... So even the trained model doesn't work very Exactly. Well. And even, okay. for, <laughs> even for proven uh, unnatural one, they just have one that's like a bit over 50% and stuff like this. So right. like, you know... So even with perfect knowledge, their model's not very good. Exactly. Okay. It's just... Good to know. This is just <laughs> saying, you know... It's, it may, it suggests a granularity and an assessment when you give clear percentages that this does not in any way satisfy and that the original one does not satisfy. So it's kind of a misapplication, a misrecalibration of the original method and what it's supposed to do, kind of forced into this new idea what they do to for, unfortunately, a, a very motivated purpose, as it seems to claim that ah, uh, it was an unnatural outbreak in you Wuhan. See, you see, this see, uh, then gets even more exact. So, so you've got a methodology which seems to make everything worst case scenario, and then you've got a media ecosystem on top of that, which is looking for the most sensationalistic Sensationalism. stuff for click, yeah. click, you know, look eyeballs. So it's it's all, you know, yes. two filters up on sensationalism, and it's just all worst case scenarios so you can see why you know people want to to, to post yeah. this in the media because they know it will drive you mm -hmm. know and, and maybe the day. last five minutes we can spend talking about the supposed impact that this might have and um i think we agree that this is not a very thoughtful paper it's not a very good paper it should probably not have passed peer review but it's now why is it being covered review. Why is it being covered from journalists that should do some due diligence that even went out to people like Alice to ask for feedback and then decide to still go ahead? What well, do I think you the think answer is there is just, is just the misalignment of the media ecosystem with, with you know, objective science is that media yeah. people want to show sensational results, right? They want to show scary results. They want people to click on and look at these articles. If you put somebody did a probability assessment and, you know, it's not that great and, you know, it works in a certain scenario, but it doesn't. Who who wants to read that? If you put, you know, bio 
you know, mm. um, gun bio, thinking, yeah, risk, go, bio weapon, risk yeah, assessment, bio weapon, bio risk assessment, lead by credentialed lovely, Australian yeah, exactly. uh, professor shows lab leak more likely than not, right? That's that's, that's, gonna be that's the, the headline, headline, right? So, so then you can understand how it goes out and why it's uh, why it's uh, clickworthy. And it doesn't just swing over people who've already made their minds up. It swings over moderate people who are unsure because it it has the the veneer. mask of yeah the veneer of acceptability and scientific rigor, yeah. and then you look under the surface and you find that it's a rotting corpse underneath. Um, <laughs> so you're welcome. I, I, yeah. I so feel my like... so my. My read, Philip, you're saying like how, how you know, what impacts would this have? It feels to me, and, you know, I'm more on the physics side, so this feels to me like you should treat this kind of like this Gunroy Finky idea more like the, the kind of Drake equation, right? So Drake equation in, you know, in, in physics for looking for mm. what's the probability that there's extraterrestrial civilizations out there. Now, the way that my buddy Dave Kipping, who knows a lot more about this, it treats that equation is not as... You slot in all of the numbers that you can't really work out properly and you come out with some weird number at the end, which a lot of astronomers do and they get it into the news and it goes in the paper. There are 57 civilizations in the Milky Way and it's just nonsense because you don't know any of the numbers, just like they don't in this analysis. The way, better way to look at that equation is here are a load of numbers that we need. We need to do the necessary scientific work to nail down the uncertainties in those areas. And a lot of that work has not been done, as Alice says. So the better way, I think, to see this sort of paper is not to put out a silly number at the end as they have, but to say, look, these are the things that we desperately need to know. Here's an assessment of the amount of work that's been done in that area. Here are the things that still need to be done and people need to all be pushing to make sure that work is done so we can get a final answer to this question. That's how you should view these problems, not as we shoved in a load of numbers that are really, really uncertain, had a bad methodology, and we cranked out a number at the end, which is sensational. Yeah. It should be about what still needs to be done to narrow down the uncertainty bounds on that final result. Um, obviously, the, 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 that's not something that's going to play well in the media. But like mm -hmm. as you said, that sensationalist headline is. So that's where we are. And this is the problem, like in terms of what this kind of paper does to both the the belief and trust in science, relations internationally, or our knowledge of the pandemic, all it does is take us backwards. And I don't like saying that, but there is not informative evidence-based content in this paper. It's the information itself is unrepresentative and the scoring system is flawed. That means all it is going to do is increase uncertainty, increase distrust, and make people look in the wrong places. What, what it also doesn't do is take us any closer to doing what we need to prevent future pandemics. And, okay, I've said from early on, chasing down bat zero, et cetera, is not, is not going to help us generate better solutions. But papers like this actively hinder us from doing it hmm. because it makes doing the research we need to do even harder. And we need to do that research because what is certain is there will be more spillovers in future. And if we do not have the data to understand them and understand how they spill over, we cannot manage them. And that is what's important because I don't think any of us want another lockdown in our lifetime. Um, and I don't think people would be as obedient anymore because that is that is the consequence of having to live through COVID. Um, and so scientists need to be responsible. And we need to be looking forward so that we can be better prepared in the future. I, I mean, even if you look at this, so again, just to make people aware of, of additional work that's come out on this subject, because because I've been kind of out of the loop of it for a little bit, is there was, um, Philip, the release of a um, survey of virology and epidemiological experts on whether they the likelihood that they put to a lab leak and basically the the experts in the field they lean very strongly towards a zoonotic origin so if you wanted to put this into a correct context it shouldn't be you know australian expert says definitely lab leak it should be one person out of a huge distribution of experts says it's down here but the distribution says it's actually over here so it needs to be correctly contextualized which of course, in the media ecosystem, 
it's not going to be. Yeah. It feels like more and more is piling up towards lab yeah. leak because people love to pump these things out. Whereas most people think it was, you know, looked exactly the same as it did in 2003 or whatever is not an exciting story to put out on the news. So I haven't seen an awful lot of play about that study that showed or that survey that showed that most people think it's a zoonotic origin. I've just seen people go, ah, oh, uh, cranks, you know, or mm -hmm. that's their job, paid up shills, uh, yeah. and just move on. But as soon as something like this turns up, it's like, tick, let's move in. Let's, you know, let's go. So, yes, I think... I, 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 but I don't want to, I think Alice's point is, is well taken. I think that the failure of peer review in this specific case is also, you know, a failure of science in, in a certain extent. So you cannot just blame no, 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 uh, media, not. but of course, I know journalists should also be critical about information they get from science papers that are published. They should do the legwork and assess because this is not difficult to assess. It took me half an hour. To assess now, I, now I haven't thing. read, I will admit, yeah. I haven't read exactly the way that they structure their yeah. output. So if they say something like Gunro Fink, modified Gunro yeah. Finky suggests maybe lab leak, then okay, yeah. fair enough. If they've said strong evidence now suggests, you know, then it depends how they've how they yeah. put their conclusions as but, to but the point is right, get through peer yeah, but want. why why would this be covered right I, I don't think journalists in general are interested in putting false information out putting misleading information out i think journalists are not interested in that and i feel like often you know having just contrarian experts on it's it's a bit of a you know at least i do you know i i I, I give everybody space. They give different opinion space. This is how political journalists think. Both sides have to get, you know, their their words in. And now at least there's a credentialed person, so we can take them and 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 whatever they say can get it out. It's through peer review, so I can wash my hands as a journalist. I get the clicks, but you know, it's peer reviewed, so it's not on me. But it's if we also look at the title, use of a risk assessment tool to determine the origin of severe yeah. acute risk. Determine the origin. Yeah, it makes it sound like look, we're, we're chasing this down, and of course, people be, they want to know, and so they're mm. going to click on that. Yeah. It feels like that title should never have got through as it is. It should be, you know, yeah. modified, you know, modern yeah. thinking uh, uh, yeah. used in outbreaks, you know, suggests yeah. Yeah. weak evidence, it explore and, the yeah, explores the risk parameters of, of yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Strong. Uh, unfortunately, we have we have a perfect cocktail of there is a motivated actor in the beginning that you know is already active in this uh, community, getting a paper published that should have been filtered out by peer review, with a sensationalist headline prone to be picked up by journalists, possibly also you know contacted activists usually tend to contact the media context to spread it and and journalists not doing the due diligence and amplifying this paper in the name of some kind of you know this side and false that balance, side yeah. false violence and and now we will have to see maybe nobody will care about it because citizens are smart or smarter nowadays after being burnt a lot they would just be like it, it's an opinion. It's a risk assessment. It, it doesn't really have any evidence to support either way. Then maybe maybe it will not get traction. My worry is, of course, that once something is going through the BBC, through Newsmax, through some credential source, a peer-reviewed paper going through a credential source, this unfortunately has all the ingredients it really needs to cascade to but, bigger audiences and manipulate people. But haven't we seen that the, this is what happens? So haven't we seen basically the... We had the paper. We have from, seen this playbook before. Well, yes. We've had this paper from Debar and um, Zach Hensel recently, which which basically showed that Jesse Bloom's assessment of these hidden genomes or whatever yeah. they were was was yes. total nonsense. Right yes. now, I yes. haven't seen much pickup of that in the news. So when this stuff goes out and suggests, you know, all nefarious things are going on, the row back on it never gets as much play as the original yes. stuff. So that's a big problem as well. Yeah, nobody will ever see, see even our video to this and we make it, uh, but nobody will ever see, uh, unless they're very motivated, will ever see the rebuttal to this. They will just get the headline, mm. get another data point in the media from, ah, actually, look, an Australian professor uh, assessed this and it's legitimate, right? It's, uh, it came through science. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm worried. I'm worried about these 
events. I'm yeah. worried what they do to our public understanding of science. I'm worried about what they do to, uh, you know, for for science and society overall. Because you know, if this for us now gets discarded as saying, oh, this is not good science and bad science. This is also not ideal because then people will say, ah, oh, how do we know what is good or bad science? Maybe you're the bad scientist and she's right, right? So you always get into a position where. It shouldn't have passed peer review, at least. You know, it shouldn't no. have been amplified by journalists. But people not doing their job always leads then scientists in direct confrontation that challenge, you know, bad science. So yeah, we are we are we are in a difficult situation. And I think that's why Alice was very passionate to come on today and, and talk about it. And um I think I think that's why we, we're still gonna do this video. I was skeptical about doing it in the first place, but I think we're gonna put it out and um we're gonna see. Maybe it, yeah. it can at I, least I think at least then when people retweet, etc., we can be like, Well, here's a discussion. You can actually get a, a few more insights as to why it's not the case. Yeah. And I mean Twitter is still somehow surviving. This is how discourse is had, but at least if we can put out good information it can try to combat the bad information even if it doesn't reach everyone hopefully at least for the more moderate people they are still willing to listen and actually realize why why we we need to be looking and thinking harder good i think we can leave it at that um i hope we will have better news in in a future conversation at the moment we are trying to to you know maintain some kind of integrity uh in the in the scientific field but of course it's very difficult when there is a lot of bad actors particularly around this topic well what i'm enjoying to seeing is that the, the scientists are working this field. look they put out a paper i'm sure there will be a response to this in the in the in the um in the literature so we've had a couple of responses recently one to that um statistics paper by stoyan and chu um you know hopefully this will get rebutted in the in the literature and we'll see we'll see what happens with that so yeah the issue is that those as we've said they often don't get seen of course, either. Of course. And so pushing it back from the outside hopefully at least it does something i I'm, I'm looking forward to the day hopefully one day that instead of discussing bad science and conspiracy theories <laughs> i can just talk about how cool bats are which is a, a never-ending so topic. that's always that's always fun you can link to that video that we we talked about the amazing yeah. uh world of bats philip I will, I will put it up right right after this so that it's linked. It's a bit more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Then thanks, both of you, for the spontaneous jumping on the call. And, no and Sam, I think it was good to, <laughs> to get your reaction from hearing. <laughs> this, was, this was like um, a live reaction, you know? So you yeah. dragged me in today and was like, we need, we need to talk about some statistics, potentially bad statistics. I was like, okay, good. I'm up for that. But, um, you know, I've been out of the uh, discussing the lovely game for a little bit of time because it said it seems to just be mostly. Never just, yeah. And, and a lot of very, very silly um, points. So nice to jump in and something that, you know, I'm vaguely uh, qualified to to talk about. So that was good. Yeah.